It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wayne, writer of Superman Birdwing, and you're listening to The All Things Kryptonian podcast, including Superman and Supergirl. We discuss games, movies, cartoons, TV shows, and comics. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Welcome to the Krypton Report. I am your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue, the man of tomorrow. And with me today is not that beautiful man named James Cole. No, no, no. We got a special treat for you today. So being the Superman I am, I decided to find, you know, a, a, another superhero. So I traveled to Fawcett City, sort of. <laughs> and I found uh, a new friend here that we're going to talk about. And I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself. Go ahead, new friend. Hey, uh, I'm Austin, and uh, I'm uh, run the Shazam cast where I talk about all things Captain Marvel and the Marvel family, and that's really about it. Just Shazam stuff, really. So, what better way for Superman and Shazam to talk than to review Superman Shazam First Thunder by Judd Winning? <clears throat> and so, we're going to talk here. I uh, found Austin's podcast here, and I was trying to check it out. Uh, I'll let him t- give you a little bit more feedback and kind of history, but the, the podcast has kind of been retooled a little bit, and Austin's kind of been, you know, relaunching the Shazam cast. So uh, why don't you just kind of tell us a little bit about your podcast, Austin? Yeah, the podcast has been around since 2015-ish, and uh, it was ran by Jeff. All the way up till last year, and he uh, was reaching out for somebody to take it over, and I reached out to him and said I was interested in it, and then I started taking it over beginning of this year, 2021, and really enjoying it, I'm trying to kind of rebrand it a little bit. I want to do a uh, twice a month podcast, but with work, it's not really working out right now, but hopefully I can get that going, and uh my plan is to uh, one week review or, you know, talk about like Fawcett comic and then the other week talk about the newer stuff. That's, that's cool. I like that. I mean, you know, uh, like I'm a movie guy and, you know, I love Superman, of course. Mm-hmm. And my wife was like, but if she's like, but if you ever made a comic book movie, she's like, I think you would do Shazam. She's like, you're very childlike. You you get very excited. And you love playing with the kids. And I'm like, it's very true. Very true. You know, and if you know, they can't see us, but I am wearing my Captain Marvel Shazam t-shirt today for our conversation. Um, but no, I, I think like, so I think, you know, it's a great podcast too. because There's a lot of rich history with the character. Um, you know, these characters that come from previous comic book companies sometimes get lost, forgotten, or people don't always know their origin correctly. You know, um, with the recent Suicide Squad movie, you know, one thing uh, that's kind of come up with certain people is that the Peacemaker was from Charlton Car- Comics. You know, one of those small comic companies that was bought by National and brought into the DC family. And that's similar with what happened with Fawcett Comics. So, and uh, my little boy, he's he's six, and we play Mortal Kombat vs. DC for PlayStation 3. It's the only Mortal Kombat game I'll let him play. And on there, it's Captain Marvel. So he's like, Daddy, why is he Captain Marvel? Because he knows him as Shazam from Injustice and, of course, the cartoons and the movie. So what I what I say to him is kind of like Shazam's like his middle name. <laughs> and that's what he goes by now. Like the way Daddy goes by his middle name, that's what Shazam does. And he's like, oh, okay. You know, because, of course, he knows of the other Captain Marvel on the other side. So it gets confusing, you know. And uh, it it is... <laughs> You know, I think um, it is weird in a lot of ways of just how the names kind of work for the character. You know, being Captain Marvel and then Mary Marvel and 
you know, and then Black Adam. But so it's a very uh, it's a rich comic universe. I feel like it's just not been touched on. So it is very rich, and there's a lot of like other characters created that like been like the word I'm looking for um, based off of or inspired by. Like, you know, you got He Man, you get the new show out now. And uh, I used to watch Ben 10 growing up, very Captain Marvel like. That was the one that I was going to bring up was He Man, because, uh, of course, with the new show, my, my one friend's a real big He Man fan. And we were watching, and of course, you know, my son's watching with us. And we, we watched some of the 2002 reboot, is kind of what we were watching, you know. And then we watched, um, of course, the Toys That Made Us and the Power of Grey Skull documentary. And we were talking about how Prince Adam in the reboot is very Shazam like, <laughs> you know, Captain Marvel. Like, all right, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I always thought that, you know, if you're going to rip off Superman, that Shazam, you know, because back in the day, you know, I mean, it's, it's prevalent. Comics just, they made Batman, they made Green Arrow, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and the big red cheese here, you know, like, Robin was created so that kids could see themselves with Batman. That was their end. And when Shazam was like, no, 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 no. You become the hero. You know, with a magic word, the kid is the hero, even when it's the hero. Because they, and I was like, that, it's great writing. The writing for those old faucets, it's just, I think they stand the test of time. And just, the or way they written by CC Beck, uh, I think he written one, but don't hold me to that. I believe there's yeah, one. Yeah, I, I can't remember. Like I am not as well versed in Shazam as I would like to be. Um, and that was one thing I found interesting. You know that about your podcast was just you know uh, listening and kind of getting some of the history, like a. Uh, I think I messaged you after I listened to, like, one of the origins that you did, uh, episodes you talking about the origin of Captain Marvel. And I was like, okay. I'm like, I'm digging it. I think the, uh, I think I only have done the origin of Captain Marvel because I plan on doing it throughout the whole the Marvel family. And I was actually supposed to have one come out last month. And work has just threw everything off. But Oh, I, I know. I've uh, I got in the habit uh, when we can't keep our podcasting schedule of like, if I get some time, kind of recording a bunch of things and then just kind of keeping them saved so that when I know that I'm busy, like when we were moving, timing for releases so that I still have content but it could be stuff I recorded a long time ago. I just saved them on the back burner. Actually, very good idea. I'm going to start doing that. You know, because um, the one thing, like, you and I were talking is, like, they have a new Shazam book that's come out that we're one issue into. I, I'm not sure when issue two comes out. Um, but what's interesting is, we were talking about this a little bit, and we'll probably touch on that more when we get to our book, but, you know, the new 52 Shazam happened, and it was what, you know, the movie's based off, and it, I, I like it. I thought it worked, you know, very well. And then Shazam and the new 52 is used kind of in the background, and then after uh, Trinity War, he kind of disappears in, uh, in, the, in the new 52, and then does not show up in Rebirth at all. And, you know, that was something I never thought about. And then he reappears in a run by Jeff Johns that ended last year that we, we kind of touched on the review because he fought Superboy Prime, but it felt like that fight got short changed. But that story in itself was just felt like a continuation of the New 52 book. It didn't really feel like it fit anywhere. So I feel like we have this new Shazam story, and it still feels like Shazam is on the outs. Like, Black Adam's part of, like, the Justice League right now or whatever. But Shazam, Captain Marvel still feels like he's on the outs of everything. Like, he's not 
you know, a part of the universe as much. I really don't think they know what they want to do with them. Or they just don't want to use them correctly. I mean, I, I agree. I I think he's a great character. I think in this book we'll point out, because it's been a while since I read this book. And I read this book on the recommendation of a friend for actually the fourth issue. Um, and it was back when the short film, the uh, Superman Shazam uh, versus Black Light or Black Adam, not Black Light, um, came out. And I, I love that short film. I wish that had been a longer, you know, DC movie than just the, the short film that it is. So, so let me ask you before we, before we dive in, why Shazam for you? What what is it about you, the character that you decided to do this podcast? I was actually introduced to the character by my dad, and growing up, we don't really have a comic book store close to us. It was about forty five minutes to an hour away, so I didn't get to go a lot. Uh, so, and we weren't like just had a lot of money either, so I didn't get to read a bunch of comics. I read what he had, which was mainly Star Wars. And then just one day out of the blue, he was like, I took this character out and it just stuck. That was about it was either eighth grade or growing into my freshman year of high school. And I just loved it. I just got hooked on the, on the origins, on the, the, the mythical aspect of it. Just, just loved every, everything about the character. And it was just, he created a monster basically for me. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember, like, I, I've talked about this before, like, there was, a, when I lived in Mississippi, my dad was in the military, so he kind of moved uh, off him. When I lived in Mississippi, there was a comic book store, but it, they opened it shortly before he moved, but it was, like, comics and cards, but it's one of those, like, I was still too young to really feel out everything, you know? Um, I was still learning it was that 90s where, you know, everybody's like, Jim Lee. You know, everybody wants the Jim Lee X-Men. That was what you found a lot of. And then after that, the only comics I could find was there was like a spinner rack at this one shop my dad went to to get pieces and stuff for his uniforms. And then when we moved to Ohio, there was one that was close but it had the weirdest hours ever <laughs> so trying to find when it was open was difficult and then when I started to be able to drive I could you know start to seek them out and stuff and libraries were always a big uh, saver and I'm always championing for people to check out libraries uh, the one here by us actually gets monthly new issues individual issues so not only do they have the trades in the system you can check out the newer issues as well. So it's it was a great place for me uh, when we moved to where we around where we are now um, was shortly after the new fifty two started, and I was working third shift, so my sleep was off. So I just did a lot of reading when like my wife would sleep and I'd be awake or whatever, um, and I just go and get everything you know from the library and of course now everything's digital so it makes it interesting to the stories like this you know like the stories that you have about there's no comic shop i found this you know we lose a lot of that now where it's like i just went online and hit purchase mm. or i subscribed to dc unlimited for seven dollars a month and i just you know um it's crazy. It's weird, but it's cool, but it's still crazy. All, <laughs> all rolled into one. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know how I feel about digital yet. I use it, but I'd rather have the print. I, you know, that, that's my thing is I rather have the print. I like digital for when I want to go, like right now. Okay, um, I kind of wish there for a while the comics did like movies do, <laughs> where you buy the physical and get a code for a digital copy. I was, I like that. Um, but like right now I have my digital copy of the book up because I'm still moving in and all my short boxes are tucked away and 
I got to dig them out and find my individual issues of certain things. So it's great to just have this quick reference of, you know, the digital, but at the same time, I like having my physical copies. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about things like physical has value, resale value, but also in any kind of physical medium, it can't be altered. You know, digital, they can go in there and change something and then reload that new file as the server and your digital copy that you have is technically not yours. Um, and whatever the alterations were is what you have. And I, I tell my friend this about Star Wars. <laughs> you know, you, you bought Star Wars digitally. Well, when Disney put Star Wars on Disney+, Plus, they re-edited once again the Greedo Han scene. So now if you have a digital copy of Star Wars, that's the copy you have because that's the file access that you get. It's not what's the one that you actually purchase, which can be good. Like um, when they did Batman 89 last year, the year before, when they re-released the Batman anthology as 4K um, and remastered, my friend's digital copies were then updated to the 4K remaster copies. So it had the new sound and you know all the everything was changed and updated so i mean that's positive hmm. but i remember when uh it was a few years ago when uh they uh, went in there and changed the color grading for batman v superman and everybody was mad about it but that about the time when they had uh you know josh whedon come in and finish justice league and they were going in that whole new direction and they changed the color grading on the on the digital of Batman v Superman, and everybody was pretty ticked off about it. Exactly. And if you own your copy, you don't have to worry about that. But it's like when they did the uh, the remastered. I'm trying to remember. So like they did the remaster of BVS where it was now in the same format that Zack Snyder's Justice League is. And I'm trying to remember, like, because I have the two digital copies, the extended and the theatrical. One of them was updated and one wasn't. I want to say the extended copy is now in the square format. I, I, I haven't checked it in a while, but I remember when that happened. And I haven't watched it since they re put it in that format digitally, so... I don't know. I don't know either. I, I meant to go watch it, but I haven't I haven't watched it since they, they claimed they did that. I'll check it out. But let's get into our book today. Um, like we said, we, we decided to go Superman, Shazam, First Thunder. Uh, we will re be reviewing issues one and two here on Krypton Report. And then you'll have to tune in to Shazam Cast to get issues three and four, which kind of is a bummer because issue four is my favorite. But what do you do? Issue four is really great. Yes. All right. So starting out in this comic, what I one thing I like about this, and I'm going to pull this up because I want to try to find the right thing that the wizard says. I like that the wizard's talking about the second age of heroes. Um, he's talking about, you know, Batman, Superman, and then he touches on a Fawcett City. They have, um, you know, their own hero. And I'm trying to find where he says it. No. He is my disciple, my herald, and my champion. For I am the wizard Shazam, and when he speaks my name, my powers, which are fueled by the gods themselves, run through him. Uh, and I think that kind of helps the reader understand exactly, like, what Shazam is. Um, you know, it, you know, in the movie, the wizard dies and, you know, gives him his power. And in this, it's kind of like the wizard still exists in some way. Um, and I think that's always kind of confused some people is how exactly the power set works or, like, when he shares the lightning, um, you know, my, my thing was always like, he's magical. He's kind of like a wizard, 
but yet he doesn't do like magic the way like magic is shown in the DC universe. Yeah. I agree with that. I, I never really put that much thought into it, but I think I agree. Because I always thought you I always thought he'd be a really interesting character to have like like if I was gonna write Justice League Dark, I think you know, you, you think Justice League Dark, you're like, okay, Constantine, Zatanna, uh Swamp Thing, Etrigan, throw Shazam in there. You know, like this young, naive child who is powered by this magical wizard, and now he's going up with like, you know, John Constantine's on his team, and we all know how that could be. So I just thought he'd be an interesting addition to Justice League Dark. That would be a very interesting addition. I really like John Constantine too, so I'd like to see those two air panel. Right. I- I mean, they they interacted a little bit during the Trinity War and the New 52, but Constantine Moore was trying to trick Shazam into something, and I'm trying to remember what it was. It's been a while since I read it. I'm being honest with you, I started reading that one, and it just never got my, like, it hold my attention, so I just kind of pushed it to the side. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. And I actually like most of the, uh, the New 52 Justice League run, but the Trinity War just... It wasn't my cup of tea. I liked Trinity War. There was a couple. But I felt like the Justice League of America was a cool idea, but that was like the one that I was like, eh. But I thought what what the whole Pandora thing was cool. The question and the Phantom Stranger were awesome. I thought that was cool the way they did. I hate that they never really revealed who the question was. It wasn't Vic Savage. It was supposed to be something like bigger, you know, um, but that never, they never got to it. Thanks. So back in our book here, <laughs> uh, we have some guys robbing a museum and they're talking about, they need these artifacts. You are a disciple of the temple of Bacchus. And, of course, Superman shows up. And he's fighting, and then he gets attacked by some Gilmore Del Toro-looking troll thing. But he has to fight. and Of course, he, he kind of fights, but then realizes magic. It doesn't go too well at the start for him. It does not. And I like in this first issue how we're cutting back between Superman and Shazam. You know, we our next like little section here is Shazam back in Fawcett City fighting some giant Iron Giant looking things. I, I, and he does well. Just I just want to say I love it whenever they have him fight like giant robot. It just I mean, who doesn't like a good giant robot fight? Like. You know, it's it's just great because it just is. You know, it's like you always think like, okay, we have to put someone in distress where we can show off the powers. All right, a plane is crashing so Superman can fly or a helicopter, you know, something where people are in the sky and he's got to save them. So that's always one of those tropes of putting someone in peril in the air. And Jeff Smith, is it Jeff Smith who did the... Uh... The Monster Society of Evil book. I think it was Jeff Smith. He he had him fighting giant robots in that, and he punches one of them, and he creates a black hole. And giant robot and Captain Marvel is the coolest thing. It, it's like being a kid, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I watch my son and how he plays and what he interacts with, and he's excited. Like, you know, oh, robot. Like, um, I don't know if you've seen the new Space Jam movie like we watched it and he got excited when the iron giant showed up and uh side note speaking of the iron giant a friend of mine were talking and we decided that if they wanted to if warner brothers wanted to make a live action iron giant like remake the anime movie as live action we're okay with this (laughs) 
and you can even get Brad Bird to come and direct it again. <laughs> um, just throwing that and out. Disney does it with their stuff, though. Warner Brothers did too. Exactly. You know, Disney used to make sequels to everything. Now they're just like, let's take our cartoons and make them live action. And we won't change the good stuff or add to the mythology. We'll just make it worse. It's just basically the same movie, but live action with some stuff taken out of it usually. Yeah. I was actually kind of excited for The Lion King just because my son, really, side tangent, was into The Lion Guard, which adds so much more mythology to The Lion King story. And I was like, oh, they could pull from this other, like, it really make this, no, they just, I swear, no, they didn't even write a new script. They just went in and probably took the original, some cut, and, like, edits, put additional edits by, and just like, here, here you go. Here you they go. took out Gar's um, song. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for going off the rails there for a little bit. Oh, no, we, I mean, Beauty and the Beast is one of my favorite Disney cart animated films. And I despise the live action version. I've been, it just looks bad. It was just horribly like, I mean, there was like the casting was on point for one character, but then they misused that character. So it even ruined the cat, that casting. Um, the only thing I liked that they did in the live action was kind of put the spin on why the, the town doesn't remember the castle. You know, it helps you kind of fill in that gap. Like, oh, okay. But other than that, nope. The only good ones they've done, Jungle Book and Cinderella. Which Cinderella surprises me because it seems like that movie gets remade like every year. But I want to say they got another one coming page. up. <laughs> exactly. But there's Disney's version and then the book. Okay, we're, we're done. We're done. We're moving on. Um, so Shazam stops the robot by Dr. Bruce Gordon, who is at the solar center. They're building this giant solar plant, basically. And then the next thing, we see Billy Batson and Scott Cooper, his best friend, in uh, basically the homeless shelter, like, or not, like a homeless place camp where Billy's living. And I think this is one thing that I think is so inspiring about Billy in this book is just the fact that Billy's got it rough, but he's still this hopeful, optimistic kid. Um, and he talks about Albert Einstein wearing the same thing. And he's like, here's your laundry. Give me a break. It was 12 shirts for a dollar. It's because he makes the comment about he wears the same thing every day. Um, you know, and his friend's like, you can come back with us. And... Uh, Billy's like, no, I like where I'm at. All I have to do is say one word. And then we get Dr. Savannah. And this Dr. Savannah is old. Old and uh, mean. Really mean. Like, and of course, he sent the robots. And what I love is he he's talking with this assistant about get Lex Luthor on the phone. He's like, you, <laughs> you hate Lex. And he's like, I never said that. He said, you said it an hour ago. <laughs> um, and then we see Billy and he says, Shazam. I mean, I have, I love the artwork for this is good. Um, but the pan, the way they arrange the panels and the like positioning of the, of the heroes and images in those panels and everything. That's what I think is really good in this book and of course there's those guys again trying to rob you know and get another artifact and this this like page here that i'm looking at you know is shazam basically saying okay big guys let's see what you're made of and the next panel is the building and the next panel is him getting punched outside the building and then he looks up and they're Superman. It's probably my he's favorite a, panel. Use a hand. So the whole, of yeah. the, this whole first issue is this last panel. I would agree with that. Um, you know what's fun is like, so I'm, we're, I, I read this, we're talking about this, and then me and my co-host James are making our way through the uh, talking about uh, Kingdom Come. We're reviewing Kingdom Come, and then where that ends with Superman and Shazam. Just an interesting kind of 
build it. If you look at this is where it started, and that's where it ends kind of thing. But All right, so we're in issue two. You know, we have Dr. Savannah meeting Lex Luthor, which is <laughs> it's just kind of interesting, you know. Um, and what I love is when, hold on, I'm going to read the exact, what he says, he says, uh, what, what do you have for me? He's called Spec. He says, why Spec? And he's just kind of like, yeah, what does it matter? You know, he's going to follow this, this, you know, person of yours. And he says he wasn't able to tell Superman and Luther's but like, I never said that. He's like, I'm here to assist you. And it's intercut. And, you know, of course, Lex is putting him down. And uh, what I think is funny is <clears throat> Lex says, you know, I don't need your money. And Savannah's like, what do you want in exchange? And Luther basically calls him out. Oh, excuse me. He says, I want you to sell to me the eight, 80,000 shares of LexCorp you've been acquiring under the mantle of other dozens of shell companies. <laughs> and I'm like, that's Lex. Um, and then we see that Spec here, you know, Spec had followed Billy. And uh, this is like a couple of days back. You know, we find out that this occurred. Because now we're back to right now with Billy looking up at Superman. That he's here. And he says, wow, I cannot believe this. I have been, wow, it's truly an honor. And holy moly, you're Superman. That, uh, that right there, uh, that reminds me of that episode of Justice League Unlimited. Kind of, when he like first meet Superman and he's like hey Superman you're my biggest fan or whatever and he's just like so yeah. excited that he's meeting Superman that he doesn't exactly know what to say or how to say it it's kind of like what I got from I don't know if it was in oh I love it like I just love the way Sh I love the way Shazam is used in the first season of Young Justice um I you know, I love Young Justice season one and season two. I think it's especially that. Have you watched all season one? No, I haven't. There's an episode with where Clarion and a couple others basically split the world into like almost like two realities where one is all the adults and one's all the kids. And so all the kids think all the adults are gone and all the adults think all the kids are gone. But Billy Shazam's the only one that can travel back between both worlds. Um, and so he's used. And at the end, like the whole like Justice League sitting there and they're like talking about how they feel that Shazam had lied to them by not revealing that he was really Billy, a child. And Batman's like, I knew. Of course Batman knew. You know what I'm saying? Like he calls them all out and he's like, I've always known. Like... So it's a great episode. Um, I highly recommend it for anyone who's a Shazam fan. Um, just because you get to see him. And it's always funny because he's like, mentally he should probably be on like the Young Justice team. But yeah, you know, he's in the, the you know, the regular Justice League. So it's always fun to play with that. I do really, I have seen that episode. And I remember he's like, I believe he's in a plane. And like he's yeah it yeah. Work, yeah and he's having to like shout Shazam to go back to the like the different worlds I guess. Yep, it's it's a, like I said, it's a great episode. Um, so back to our comic. Uh, we see Superman and Shazam looking at these magic made muckmen, and they punch them. And Superman's like, "Nice shot!" And Shazam, you know, thanks. And they're just you know they're palling it and. Superman gets basically crystallized in this thing. Meanwhile, the guys are stealing what they need. We find out that they have this little small dude uh, named Timothy Barnes kidnapped, and he's supposed to be of this lineage. And, you know, I love this line of, it's okay, Superman, I got your back. And Suzanne shows up, and he says, don't move, Superman, I don't want to hurt you. 
and he punches the stuff away. And he says, catch your breath. He says, I never get winded and uses his freeze breath. And I just, I just love Shazam's holy moly. And then of course, um, you know, these creatures are shooting that same magic stuff at Superman. Shazam gets in the way and blocks it, takes it back, pushes him, and then Superman freezes him. Um, and you know, and I just, I just like them talking. Um, and I like Shazam says it was a it was a crystalline force beam. It's actually how mollusk trolls excrete waste. You fought those monsters before, and he says no. I just know things. Wisdom of Solomon. Um, you know, I just I just like that Shazam is smart, and I like how he asked Superman, "Do you have some time to talk?" And I just like them throwing out at Mount Everest. I'm going to be completely honest with you. And Shazam. On this. Um, Story-wise, there's a lot of comic that just has better stories in this. But them mm-hmm. just talking is what makes this for me. Besides issue four. Oh, totally. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as like the whole, I, I feel like that's the story. That's what they want to tell is just really... Shazam looking up to Superman and like building this relationship of these characters and they just needed the other thing in the background to have something to fight. Um, because like this page right here where Shazam's just freaking out and loving his powers. Um, and, you know, Superman even says he starts to open up and like you know, to, to him. And he says, I, Superman says, I forgot myself there. I don't ever talk about, well, this with anyone, not like this. I made it a point to keep my life when I'm not wearing the uniform separate. I'd rather not discuss the specifics of who I am. He says, when you're not Superman, yes, I hope you understand. He says, well, sure, I understand. I just think it kind of stinks. You know, and... So, like, that, that's the heart of the story. And then, of course, we find out Savannah, you know, and they, they create Sabak, this basically anti-Shazam kind of thing where he is powered by Satan, Anam, Gileel, Beelzebub, Asmodeus, and Kratos. And the dude says the name. We have, you know, their champion, arrives and this is the part where I feel like the story kind of goes off the rail (laughs) this is where I'm like you could have left this out I think and I think if you were to adapt this into a an episode or a movie storyline I think you would leave this out but we find out that Dr. Bruce Gordon is really uh, having some issues you know the book cuts back to um you know, Superman and Shazam talking, and he asks him about, uh, you know, Superman tells about what his outfit is, and Shazam, he asks why the cape, he says it comes with the outfit, and he says, well, it's kind of a long story, and he's trying to tell him, like, you know, where he comes from, but they have trouble back in Fawcett, and they're like, okay, and then we, the last page is, we see basically Sabak up top, and then this person with a half two faced looking moon face, which is Eclipso. And we find out that Eclipso is Dr. Gordon. And that's the end of issue two. So, dear listeners, Austin and I will be back. So we're gonna have to cut you off here, guys. You'll have to catch up with me and Austin over on Shazam Cat. Austin and I got cut off a little bit because of some technical whole stuff, but you can check Austin out on Shazam Cast where any podcasts are available. Just search for ShazamCast. All right, check you later. Hello, everybody. I just want to let you know that Southgate Media Group has its own Patreon. That's right. For $5 a month, you can get exclusive shows, content, and interviews with the different podcasters of the network. This Week in Geek is a 
Patreon exclusive only series. So check it out. Go www.patreon.com slash Southgate Media Group. We are always adding new content. If you want to help out this show and any other show on Southgate Media Group and you really don't have the extra money to do so, check this out. Go to southgatemediagroup.com. At the top, there's a link to Amazon. Click that, log into your Amazon, shop and buy like normal, and part of the money that you spend comes back to us to help us with our podcasts. The Krypton Report is part of the Southgate Media Group network of podcasts. If you have an interest, check out Southgate Media Group to see if your podcast is there. I bet it is. At the Southgate Media Group website, you can sign up for our newsletter. You'll get info on all the shows and you can find what you want. You'll also find links to our sponsors where you can get great products and support the podcast. Also, our book, Pod Life, Podcasting Stories. It's a great book. Check it out. It's nice to hear where people come from and why they do what they do. Look up in the sky.